Hi. Hey, Lauren, how are you? I'm, I think I'm supposed to ask you that first, but <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm here. How are you? I'm, I'm here. I'm here. Great. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I have so many questions and I think I'm just gonna get right to it because I I have an issue with time. And so I wanna make sure we, you know, we stay on time. And my first question is about white space. Um, I have, you know, the two previous books in the triptych with me. I have Citizen, I have Don't Let Me Be Lonely, two books that have been so, so dear to me. I have and <laughs> that still that still tickles me. I can't I can't when you hold that book. But um and I think there's so much that can be said about the way white space is laid out differently in these two books. Um and don't let me be lonely. I think it's you know it's more of the the off white of white, as you put it in just us, right? Um whereas in Citizen we get this really stark whiteness that um you know, a mutual person in our lives, uh, Lauren Berlant has called sterile even in a conversation you two had in 2014. And then we have the beautiful Just Us, um, where even in the dedication for us in this black type, and it's so small in this white space, and we have, we have paragraphs and stanzas and tweets and images and portraits and then still so much white space and in blank pages arranged on um, on the page and in the book. And so I'd love to hear um, how you were thinking about white space in the making of, of this book in particular, which I realized I should have put the book jacket back on. Um, it's well, naked. Do but... <laughs> <laughs> you know her work? She's a, a fantastic photographer. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful, it's I the, mean, yes. It's at the mall. White space. Um, I think you know when I'm, I'm when I'm putting together these books, I, I'm really interested in how you can get the structure to reflect the content. Um, and and in thinking about whiteness, thinking about whiteness as a pervasive um, attitude, um, power structure. Uh, all of that, how can you just have the text, the negotiation of the text, be surrounded by that? And in terms of, um, of this book, the whiteness of the page, which, you know, I, I was very lucky to get Grey Wolf to, to be willing to cover the cost of that heavy white stock, um, which is always a negotiation because it, it, it costs money. <laughs> and, um, but it also speaks to the subject, so it's intentional, yes. Rather than that kind of newsprinty off white of, um, of Don't Let Me Be Lonely. And in Don't Let Me Be Lonely, I, I intentionally wanted it to be that newsprinty because I wanted the book to reflect a kind of media newspaper rag um, atmosphere. So how, how does the media inflect how we think about our history and the news in, in that book? Yeah, and, and on the subject of media, I, I would love to know how your relationship with uh, media, uh, broadly considered, or as you consider it, has changed between um, the newsprintiness of Don't Let Me Be Lonely and the, the thick uh, white stock of, of Just Us? Just Us, um, as you know, is arranged with um, the Verso and the Recto page facing each other. And um, the Verso page contains tweets, fact checks, images, etc. And one of the things that I'm interested in with this book, which is in a way, a way of speaking back to the current times where we're sort of in a constitutional crisis, not sort of, we're in a constitutional crisis and we're on the brink of a fascist um, takeover in this country. And so I was interested in how much that takeover had to do with the proliferation of this idea of fake news 
and no facts or any facts or no science or, you know, and so I wanted the, the book to have a space where it could hold actual facts, where it could hold actual images, you know, things actually that were said, um, um, percentages actually that happened. Um, so that, that um, verso side of the page becomes a space to push back on the kind of um, subjective remembering of experience. And it, it has a kind of reciprocity. It's like, I give you my memory, you give me some facts, you know? As opposed to what we saw last night with, I give you <laughs> some lies and a lot of bullying talk and we move on. I, I don't know what we received last night, truly. Um, and I, I, I was really also fascinated by the, the cues we get um, in the form of the, the red dot, right, beside the, um, beside the text. And um, another thing I was interested in thinking about all of the, so you know, on one side we have citations, we have facts, um, on the other side, we have questions, so many questions. And I think what's interesting is that as readers, I think we're sort of trained to look out for, say, the unanswerable questions or the seemingly unanswerable questions or the philosophical questions or rhetorical questions or whatever um, qualification you'd like to put on it. Um, and yet I was also really fascinated by the entanglement of those sorts of questions with questions that actually do seem to have really concrete answers. So, you know, there's the questions about, you know, what so-and-so could be thinking, which we'll never know, you'll never know, I'll never know. Um, but then there's questions like um, on page 15, did the United States government bomb the black community in Tulsa, Oklahoma? Or the woman who's worried about her son being killed in Brooklyn, killed by whom? And it's like, I think we know um, by whom. And so I'm wondering what the intended experience is of putting these more concrete, answerable questions next to the unanswered questions. Um, and did you ever do any fiddling with the sort of order of the questions as written or were the sequences as you're writing this uh, pretty much left alone? Um, well, the book, you know, I've had, I've had a lot of criticism of this book that it doesn't give answers. It's, it's, it has no, um, purpose in terms of a solution to our times, but it was never meant to be that. It was meant to be a process opened out to the reader so that the reader could enter into the process of reading and, and, and understand that, you know, how it works for me is that I hear a thing, I associate to a thing, I might look up a thing, and, and then they're sort of invited into that wondering as well. And so those red dots, you can use them to go to the fact check or to the image. And sometimes the image is loosely associated with the text. And that to me is an invitation to, to imagine. Imagine and associate off of that image and you know, take it another step. So I was trying um, and hopefully sometimes succeeding in the creation of an open text. And, and that's important because of the ordering. Um, there is no fixed order. You know, you could really just open the book and start it anywhere you wanted and read one of the essays or one of the redacted poems and then try that the next night. Or you could start from the beginning and move forward. I, you know, sometimes I think the more personal things might have been at the end, they might have been at the beginning. It, but it, in the end, it was a little bit um, a created sequence in the moment, but not a fixed sequence in in terms of 
how I expect the reader to receive it. And, and those critiques you've gotten um, in regards to the, the lack of, of answers, do you think there's a racialized dimension to that? Or maybe there, I mean, there has to be, right? Um, well, yeah, what do you think that would well, I think, I think, you know, this book was written a, a year ago and it was written as a critique of a population that allowed a white nationalist to take office. And, and I don't just mean the 62% of um, white men who voted for this. And you, know, and you can't tell me you didn't vote for this because he said, this is what we were gonna get. He said, I'm gonna build a wall. He says, I'm gonna keep people out. He, he you know, said, you should deal with black people like they did in, um, during Jim Crow, during the fifth. So, he said it. So, you know, people, this is what they voted for. So they're getting what they voted for. Um, and, and as to white women, I mean, some people, some places it says 52%, some places it says 47% of white women voted for him. Um, either way, he got a plurality. Even if the vote was um, manipulated and stolen, still, uh, you know, huge numbers of white people who who wanted something else didn't vote at all. Or and and that says to me that they didn't care about the ways in which this president would limit the possibility for brown and black people in this country. So the book was meant to be um, to walk in through another door in terms of looking at anti-Black um, activity from the neighbor to the executive office. And, and to really begin to take people on in terms of the um, the falsity of the narratives of benevolence that they insist that I join them with by claiming they don't know stuff, you know. Um, so, so that that was sort of the intent for the book. So I think when you have a summer of protests um, and what we have seen. I think certain readers are gonna be like, okay, what's next? And the idea of having a conversation with somebody else, a close read of what might be going on in their imagination versus your own seems um, not active enough. But, you know, my feeling is institutions are made up of people. And we have let those people um, pretend, especially white liberals, to have one idea that they present to us of equity and democracy in this country, and then the actual activity that they're involved in that actually limits our own mobility and puts us in a world of surveillance and possible death. So, so the process of, of actually trying to listen to the other person so that we could know where we all stand is a process I think we've lost. We, you know, we, 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 we've gone beyond that. So it slows down everything in a time when everything seems to wanna to speed up. So I think I think that might be some of the uh, the sources of the irritation. I could, yeah, that seems. I understand. I think I I I can see that. Um, though part of me also feels like that that urgent questioning or that urgent sort of hunger for the the answer, the solution, is something that would still chase you if this came out two years ago or, you know, three years hence or, or, or something like that. 
Um, I have a question about Afro pessimism <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and a question about the inquisitive mode this book takes um, and also citations that, you know, do honor to um, Afro pessimist thinkers. Um, there's a somewhat sly reference towards the end of the book to a friend's language for the role of non-black people of color within white nationalism, um, language calling them the quote, junior partners of that project. And I think those who are familiar with Afro-Pessimism recognize that language is belonging to Frank B. Wilderson III, um, who was cited by name earlier in the book. And um, you also include terminology from scholars who, whether or not they would identify their work or identify with um, or claim Afro-pessimism for themselves and for their work have certainly contributed to the wider net of interpreting the world as irrepar like, irreparably made uh, and sustained by anti-Blackness. So people like Saidia Hartman, Christina Sharp, Orlando Patterson, uh, Sarah Ahmed. And yet, uh, I think one of the sort of prickliest gripes that people have with scholarship on anti-blackness is the sense that um, it can sometimes be airless or people, you know, a critique people have is that it can be airless or that it doesn't leave room for say wondering or wonderment. And, I, and I'm wondering where you see your book and this book standing in relation to that thought and also critiques of that thought. Um, you know, also bearing in mind that that's you know, it's really thoughts, it's so plural, a plurality of thought, but, um, you know, broadly thinking about studies on anti-Blackness that get cited here. Well, I think the reason you can find Frank Wilson, um, Cydia Hartman, Fred Moten, um, Orlando Patterson inside Just Us is because obviously I read them and I find their work incredibly important, um, but I am not them. And so that I think, um, is the difference, I, you know, even in the sense that I'm a poet, I, you know, I work in a realm of um, a different realm in terms of the importance of affect and the importance of um, the emotional space of reciprocity and, and the encounter um, by virtue of my genre, in a sense. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, Afro-pessimism is an important, um, contribution to our ability to understand what it means to be in a culture where anti-blackness is structurally embedded in, in, in our history, in our now, in our tomorrow, um, along with white supremacy. Where I might part kind, you know, I've talked to Frank about this, where I might part company with Frank has to do with my belief that if I'm here, I'm here. And, and so I still believe that I need to be involved in the democratic process as it stands because there is the theoretical space of it and then there is the actual space of it for me as a person with a family, with a job. And you know, so I, I don't understand how we can stand outside the process even as we're subject to the process. We can stand, we can critique the process and understand that we have no value to certain people within that process. Um, but we can't di divorce ourselves from it because to me, that's a way of divorcing ourselves from our possibility of change, for a possibility of, of, of living. And especially because um, these theorists are so inside the institutions that they themselves are critiquing, you know? So I'm like, if you're inside the institutions and working within them, 
is it responsible to then advocate that people um, not vote, for example? Um, I, you know, I find I, 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 that's where I sort of have a hard time understanding what that is. And, and, you know, Frank and I have gone back and forth around that, but it's sort of like, I like to think about it as, as, you know, Martin Luther King had a, 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 an amazing um, importance in our history in terms of getting um, legislation in this country. Um, Malcolm X had an amazing influence on the, the gestalt of the culture. You know, so everybody is sort of doing the thing that they're doing and it's functioning not always in the same way. And, and that's why there are lots of black people doing lots of different things. And, um, and together we move forward. So I, yeah, I don't really see a conflict even if I don't agree a hundred percent. And how does how does that language of of the person in the institution come to bear on on situations where it feels like the institution is relatively small, if that makes sense? So there's actually a, a part in the book that I'm thinking of. Um, the there's a there's an instance where a friend there's a racist incident at a I believe it's a preschool, and the friend ultimately decides to take her black child out of the school and sort of turn her back on the situation, sort of just move on with her life um, rather than sort of sit with the sort of messy and, and uncomfortable racism that has just occurred um, and that occurred and involved her child. And it seems like, you know, this prompts a wave of questions, questions about whether you know, the, you know, you should be questioning this person's response, what she was thinking. Um, and I'm curious if that, you know, is that sort of an example of somebody trying to stand outside of a thing that they're already within? And, and is that to you a sort of losing strategy or is there, um, by virtue of bringing it up, maybe some sort of value there or a strategy there that actually is working? Well, I, I don't think it's a losing. I think, um, you know, in that case, she explains that her priority was her child. My reaction to it is different, but it's not my child. And um, so I think as two black women, we were standing relative to an interaction from very different points of view. Me as somebody who is a friend looking at a narrative and her as a mother, was like, I need to get my kid and go. Um, and also somebody who has, it might have been a different story if socioeconomically she didn't have the ability to get her kid and go. You know, she just moved in from that place to another place, but that comes with a kind of economic ability that not everybody has. If she had to stay there, then she might have felt like she had to say something. You know, so I think we're always negotiating these things based on um, our own investments in it. In the book, it was important to me because it allowed me then to have a discussion around the criminalization of black children from the get-go. That, you know, especially black boys inside the classroom. So when I had these conversations, I didn't know necessarily they will end up in the book, but once I had them and had the questions and the thoughts, the, the next step was really how much can I mine them for other dynamics in the culture and um, be able to kind of um, create a blueprint from this um, passing um, exchange with a friend into greater uh, tendencies and trends in our culture related to anti-blackness over time, you know, from, from the get-go to now. So we are sh shortly, um, we'll be turning to the video, but I did want to slip in 
uh, one more question, uh, mainly about the the context of the situations that get reenacted in this book, which seem to predominantly occur in scenes of dinner parties in airports. And I'm actually really mostly curious about uh, the airport uh, because I think it has become like this really compelling place for black writers to document racial encounters like as they are happening. And you know, you do that yourself with the tweet from Roxane Gay and the sort of hear here response uh, from director Barry Jenkins. Um, I also recently read uh, Isabel Wilkerson's recent book and she documents there a lot of encounters uh, where she is both either unseen or too seen in a way that's also really animated in your book. And I'm just so curious that, you know, out of the gamut of, I'd say like mundane activities and mundane encounters with racism that I'm sure you could pull from, um, why does the airport <laughs> as one particular space of the mundane uh, loom so large and, and what makes it special? Well, I, you know, it's two things. One, it metaphorically lends to the idea that if we're not having these conversations in, in our day-to-day -day lives, can we find a liminal space, a space outside of um, here and there? to create the, the time and the examination of these encounters. So there was that, I was really interested in using the idea of liminal space to, to mine um, white supremacy in a different way, white mobility in a different way. Um, also, I think airports are a place where you, you wait you, it's kind of like um, before there was the airport and now there's the pandemic, you know? <laughs> you have this time that you're not doing, you're not rushing to this and rushing to that. You actually have to give over the time to, um, to the arrival of the plane, the delays, this, that. And I think because people in airports are not accountable to anyone, they act out in ways that they might not as explicitly in, in work. I mean, in, in our workplaces, they do as well, but it's, it's a different dynamic. Often it comes with history. There's something like very um, crystal about the behavior of white people towards black people in in airports where they they don't know you you on a certain level you don't exist and and they can be themselves you know and and they don't really need um, to be accountable to anyone um, so so I do think that they're and they're often tired you know people are tired they're sleepy. And so the so they they're doing they're acting from like a true place <laughs> rather than a uh, um, uh, a socialized place. Yeah, I love um, I love the experience of traveling with someone for the first time because I think that's like being with someone at an airport like that is you like know them in a way that like you could know them for decades and and not know them in the same way as like when they hear that their plane is delayed or you know they something whatever um i think we should turn to the video okay. now situation 11 is there anything you would like to say to preface this or well i think i think you know trump has um he sent out a tweet recently uh directed to white women in the suburbs i don't know if you saw that he said that um, the suburbs would be invaded, if not for him, the suburbs would be invaded by low income housing. And that if Biden was elected, he would uh, appoint Cory Booker to HUD. And I loved the, the, word, the use of the word invade. And then, um, and in case you didn't understand, 
that low income housing was supposed to be people of color, black people. He then brought out the black man, you know, Cory Booker. And so I, I and it, it's, it's, it was a tweet that's important to me. It, it's not in the, the um, video, but it's important to me because it points to a constituency that is complicit, but hardly ever um, named inside of white supremacy. And so this video um, base, it finds its originating action in the actions of Amy Cooper, the, the woman in um, Central Park Ramble, who confronted the bird watcher or was confronted by the bird watcher. And um, so that's, that, that's the frame for it. Great, I think tech people will work their magic and There is an African American man I am in Central Park. He is recording me and threatening myself and my dog. Amy Cooper calls the police on a black man bird watching. Hers was a quotidian reminder, reminder of the normalcy of how can I put it? Having not been meant to survive. Christian Cooper, no apparent relation, asked Amy Cooper to put her dog on a leash. It was a simple ask in accordance with the rules of Central Park's ramble. I am enthralled with Cooper's affect, her plaintive 911 call of distress. I'm gonna tell them there's an African American man threatening Intensified with each repetition of the phrase I am being threatened. And there is a man, African American. I am being threatened. He is recording me and threatening. By the third me repetition, her voice there is quivers. Man. I am in but she's able he to multitask and reattach and the leash to the dog as she speaks. Like an actor heightening her fear in her performance of a line, she pushes on. I'm I am being threatened. threatened. Cooper and I both recognize she can bet on racism, racial profiling, and possible unwarranted murder of a black person to be supported systemically by random policemen, prosecutors, judges, and the carceral system at large. Our mutual socialization into repeated patterns of discrimination allows her to do what she does and prepares me to understand what she is doing in the daylight of what I am seeing. Where we part company, where we part, where I am no longer a part, is in her expectation that I will agree that she is afraid. Do fantasies create real emotions? Is Christian Cooper's possible death an acceptable loss? History says, yes. Yesterday said, yes. If fantasies are relevant to the moment, are they not also relevant to the consequences of the moment. Can I categorize Amy Cooper's behavior as an American story that plays fast and loose with notions of imagined fear? To imagine herself as a rescue, to imagine herself into a rescue narrative <laughs> is to activate a covert white female power trigger that can easily call in the violence of white men. One white friend puts it this way. Amy Cooper assumed her role as a piece of high value white property in jeopardy, tapping into what she knows to be a salient catalyst for swift and deadly intervention. 
given this, is her performance more incredulous rage than fear? The rules. The rules don't apply to her. Am I to understand her as thinking, or is it feeling the fullness of? Don't you see who I am? Is that white living right below, just below, a level of civility, unspoken but believed? Rage tied to white identities assumes sense of ownership of all property. Her park, her so city, I am. her apartment building, her, because I would like her, to know who's friends her president, her police and why you're here. Cooper's exact words were, I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. Hers is the language of good manners, weaponizing the narratives of white racism. Excuse me, she says to Christian Cooper as she dials the police. There are so many Amy Coopers Women like Lucy Foreman Hartley, the white woman who served as justification for the Tulsa massacre, the white woman behind the Rosewood massacre, the two white women behind the imprisonment of the Scottsboro boys, Carolyn Bryant Dunnan, who finally admitted to lying, but whose admittance could not bring back to life. Emmett Till, or Linda Feirstein, who prosecuted the Central Park jogger case and willfully sent five Black and Latinx teenagers to prison for years. For years on false and suppressed evidence. Do I need to go on? The various modes of behavior that white women weaponize in service of Black death are there to be metabolized. It's an old script supported by this one. I think I'm, I think we're back. Are we back? Welcome. Hi again. <laughs> I you know I wanted to make that video because I felt like I would, if I had written just us now, that would have been a point of discussion because I cannot tell you the number of people who called me afterwards and said, you know, what Amy Cooper did was racist, but should she have lost her job? Isn't that going a bit too far? And these are white people. And I feel like, you know, if somebody calls for, this isn't, you know, she made that phone call in the same 24 hour cycle of the death of George Floyd. And, and liberal white women had the gall to call me up and say, the fact that her company decided that she was not equipped to deal with clients who were at, at white or black or Asian or whatever, is something that they felt an affront with. And I, I, you know, I'm still trying to figure out what that is. Is it that they feel like if they do something, they're going to be caught, they're also going to be held accountable, that they felt like they needed to, to, um, to claim that the ramifications were too much. You know, one of, one of the things that I was really sad about is that Christian Cooper refused to, um, join in, uh, you know, 
a court case against her for illegally calling the police. And, and I wish he had because I, I, I feel like he mistakes that moment as about him rather than seeing it as a pattern that white people are able to employ without feeling that they need to be accountable to the debts that might ensue from it. That, you know, they can willy nilly just make claims that are out of their, their imaginary defensive positioning. And, and the law says it's okay. And when he refused to join the DA in, in, um, in that case, I, I felt like he thinks this is about him. It's not about him. It's about a pattern that needs to stop. Do you, yeah, I, I'm so torn. Part of me disagrees, but I, I think you're not alone in that disappointment. I, I actually recall, so I'm like very extremely online all the time. And I do recall the wave of disappointment that happened after it was reported that that Cooper was not, I don't want to use the word not cooperating, but was declining to you know pursue this further um, to something that could lead to something like a precedent um, in regards to the, the behavior behavior is such a neutral term um, of Amy Cooper. And I don't know, I just, I do wonder, you know, is that disappointment, is that not making it about us, a thing that happened to, to him? And that, you know, what it would mean to encourage further intervention from the state um, on a matter that, I mean, these things, you know, it always just like comes to bite us in the butt. Like even when it's supposed I to be I mean, that If you can't be anti-policing and still ask the justice system that you don't believe in to then move in um, when, you, when you feel, I, I, I see that, but it, it wasn't really even if it actually worked. I didn't even care if she, if it worked, but I just, think that given that that's the mechanism we have for holding people accountable, um, because we can't just have these white people keep calling the police and then people dying and they walk away. And then in interviews, they say, yeah, I know he did nothing, but you know, we saw that in the Walmart case where he called, the guy called the police, the police show up, they shoot the guy. He's interviewed two days later by, um, you know, the Guardian or something. And he admits that he knew the guy was doing nothing. And, and, and that makes no difference. I, you know, I find that, I find it insulting. Um, yeah, it's, it's horrifying. And I would have, I mean, I would have loved to see you <laughs> write about it in the alternative universe where um, what it happened such a way that you could write about it in this book. Because I do think there's so many scenarios where you're kind of stuck in a situation that's like happening to you and trying to puzzle through, trying to puzzle through what is ultimately an impossibility, which is like, I wish this, wasn't happening to me right now? And how do I ask the thing or not ask the thing that can make this not be happening? And and that's, I think that's such a crisis of, of black life, really. I mean, I think that's, I mean, very relatable, um, so to speak. But I, I did wanna, um, a question I did have, because you do write about, or you do include the language of um, someone like, I think her nickname was Kermit Patty, um, and other white callers who were caught on video. And I do remember there was like a sort of a rash of these videos in the summer of 2018 and they were played for laughs and these people got nicknames, but the Amy Cooper video seemed very different. Um, and I'm not sure if it has to do with the coincidence with the, the murder of Floyd, but 
it just seems like the genre of the video, even as it does sort of take the same sort of route as the sort of barbecue Betsy or Betty, I, I lose track of their names, but mm -hmm. even as it's in a sort of a genealogical link to those videos, there wasn't, the humor seemed to have been like sucked out of that event. It was really about her name as her name and not a nickname and not laughing at it, but really trying to get either justice or retribution or um, shame. Well, upon. Don't you think that it had something to do with Christian Cooper's response? I think um, there was something about the Amy Cooper video because it wasn't a third party. It was, you know, Christian Cooper um, really came up against Amy Cooper. And the, you know, it, it's the kind of thing that if you were writing it from the imagination, no one would believe you. But they both have, you know, the fact that they both have the same last name. And so it's like the same slaveholder brought <laughs> forward these two people from, you know, two sides of the of, of the same history, even though she's Canadian. And um and then and then he, you know, I've heard people say because he was a queer man, there was it took it into a different realm. It, um, but I I there was something about the fact that he was able to frame it for what it was when in real time. So he was he it wasn't as if he was responding so much as saying this is what you're doing and and the falsity of it you know the fact that even um white people who are at the ready to justify these moments couldn't really justify away her claim that she was afraid when he's the one who was saying don't approach me don't come near me what are you doing you know so i think i think there were certain dynamics in that video that sort of removed it from the the other kinds of encounters that we've seen. One of the critiques I saw of, I guess it was like a meta critique of the sort of hoopla around the Coopers, um, was a critique of the emphasis on what Christian Cooper was doing or not doing, um, which is to say he was bird watching um, an emphasis on the sort of quiet, um, sort of, I don't know, I'm gonna, I'm thinking regalness, but not regal is not the word I'm looking for, but the quietude of an act like bird watching compared to the screeching, yelling, shouting um, of Amy Cooper's performance behavior. And I think some people thought that in sort of making Christian Cooper the sort of model, you know, in the language of, oh, he wasn't even doing anything, that that in itself contains within it, um, you know, ultimately a sort of anti-Black reading of the situation. Because does it matter if Christian Cooper was bird watching or if he was Exactly. Hip hop music. And I'm curious what you what you think about that. Well, um, this is why I say um, Christian Cooper um, should have understood it was not about him. That, you know, that is why I sort of regretted his lack of action, because um, I think the guys who were in Starbucks, the guy who was trying to get into his building, um, Henry Louis Gates trying to get into his house, <laughs> you know, all of those people are one people in response to the same action of being criminalized um, falsely by um, these, these white people who believe the law will protect them, that they can weaponize uh, a constructed and created fear in order to um, close down a conversation, you know? Because most of these things are encounters where it's, that are ordinary. Um, and then suddenly the police are involved. 
Um, I I think Jared Jared's gonna get me if I ask another question. I think so. Um, I believe it is time for Q and A. Yes. Yes. I'm good evening, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, my name is Jared Jackson. I'm the literary program coordinator at Pen America. Um, I want to thank Aaron and Lauren Michelle Jackson for the conversation. Um, as Lauren mentioned, we'll be moving to a brief Q&A um, before concluding the evening. And we'll begin with a question from May De La Cruz. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, hi. Oh, hello. Hi. oh my god what an honor it is to get to ask you a question oh my god <laughs> i'm nervous my name is maybe de la cruz and i teach here in the dance department at scripps um and i um i had sent in a question about i guess um it's about citizen and um it's about this idea you talked about um writing as an invitation to imagine um, which in a way is related to what I'm I'm wanting to ask about. Um, and then you later said imaginary, just their imaginary defensive position. And I think of citizen as this um, beautiful and insightful and critical exploration of the psychic life of racism and the interiority of black white relations in particular in the United States and that internal mental dialogue. So this may be a really hard question, but I wanted to know um, about where, how would you characterize, if possible, either through your own imagination or through anecdotes uh, that you've accumulated since the publication of Citizen, how would you characterize the psychic life of, life of the book itself? Of, uh, of Citizen or Justice? I'm sorry? Of citizen or justice? Of citizen. I was thinking of citizen, yes. The psychic life of citizen. Since its publication, yeah. Well, I think, you know, um, citizen lives in the space of the unsaid. It really is the, the project of citizen was how do I bring language to moments that happen like that? You know, you, you literally are still trying to figure out, did that just happen? Did he or she just say that to me? Um, and so how, how to sort of concretize, concretize that inside um, the space of a prose poem. And because the, the those incidents were given to me, I didn't feel like I could give them an interiority, which is why I wrote Just Us, because then if I became the subject, then I could explore the um, unstableness of all of the, 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 emotion, the emotional landscape that I am constantly readjusting and swerving and, um, moving up and down, trying to locate myself inside of these encounters. So, so I think, I think um, for Citizen, the lyric space of the unsaid, the way in which language allows us almost to bring up um, a picture of a thing was, was, was the intent, but I didn't. I didn't feel like I was able to mine the interiority so much in that book, not in the way that I I, I felt um, I could in just us. Um, thank you, May. Um, next, we have a question from Larkin Barnard Bond, who will also be brought on stage. Awesome. Hi. Hi, I'm Larkin. I'm a freshman at Scripps College, and um, I'm so honored to be asking you a question. Um, I loved reading your novel, Citizen, or Lyric Citizen, um, and I was interested. You, were you wrote Citizen while teaching at Pomona College. How did your time at the Claremont Colleges influence and inform your writing of Citizen?
Well, the, you know, the Claremont colleges are a very um, white dominated space in many ways. And so it, it allowed me to see things, you know, I think on the, on the block that I lived in, in, in um, Claremont, for a long time, I was the only black woman on that block. And so I always felt like I needed to invite my black friends over so my daughter wouldn't think I was the only black person in the world besides her. Um, so I, you know, it, it does, many of these college towns where the, especially um, where the housing prices are so high, they self segregate in a way it's, you know, and, um, and it, you know, I, I, I haven't, been in Claremont in the last four years, so things might have shifted. But at, at that time, there weren't, um, it wasn't that diverse a place. So I think it allowed me to see um, the issues of citizen even more clearly. Great. Thank you. Uh, we have a question coming from Ariel So. Hello. Hi, um, I'm Ariel and I'm a Scripps alum. Again, it's I'm so grateful for this opportunity to speak with you. I'm a huge fan of Citizen. Um, and I wanted to ask, so in your essay, Liminal Spaces, um, you talk about needing to engage with people we don't normally speak to. Um, and so I guess my question is, what would you say or what do you believe is the single most urgent thing for us to do as writers to engage or to have the power to change, you know, today's racial tensions and political climate, especially in the face of feeling unheard or feeling helpless and powerless. Well, I don't say you should do that. I said in a time when people um, are not doing that, I felt like I should do that. But I, you know, I think the thing about any kind of creative work you can't think about it in terms of should. You really have to go where the work takes you. Um, you know, I don't believe I am an activist. In fact, I have friends who have told me I am not an activist. Um, I, you know, I'm a writer. I'm experimenting with how to show a thing, how to enact a thing how to bring process to the page. Um, what does it mean to, to what, you know, what's a conversation? In fact, was a question. The, the first question wasn't about race. It was about what's a conversation? What are we building when I'm trying to talk to you? Whether you're my husband or my child or a strange white man in um, JFK. So I, you know, I, I was starting there along with a deep anxiety around having a white nationalist as a president. Both of those things were sort of in play at the same time as I was working on this book. But, but I don't think as a writer you, you should, one can even make yourself go out there and, and write a book to correct racism or correct anything. I, you know, I think you just have to um, follow whatever thing, even if it seems trivial, ordinary, um, frivolous. I, I, that's where I would go. That's where I would stay until I was made to move somewhere else. And so now we have a, a few questions just from uh, the chat. And um, one of the questions um, is, how would you want your books to be introduced to high school students? How do I? How would you want your books to be introduced to high school students? Um, books that follow a line of inquiry, books that explore questions, um, books that are interested in um, the space between you and I, you know, I and thou, 
um, books about intimacy, about friendship, about the lack thereof, inside a country um, committed to anti-Black racism, you know, anti-Blackness. I, I could do it that way. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, you know, uh, you and Lauren both, uh, you spoke about uh, book jackets earlier. So one of the questions actually is what inspired the, the cover for Citizen? For Citizen? For Citizen specifically. Um, yes. I'm like, no, just us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you can answer both. <laughs> Citizen. Um, um, so the cover of Citizen is David Hammond's In the Hood, um, which he did in 1994. And I was really interested in the fact that this hoodie, um, which happened um, after the beating of Trayvon Martin, was still relevant after the death of, I mean, of um, the beating in Los Angeles of, who do I want? Um, you know, the LA riots. Um, uh, Rodney King. Rodney King. The big, so that came out in, the cover came out in relation to that. And the death of Trayvon Martin, when people saw the cover, they thought it was about Trayvon Martin and his hoodie. So that overlap in history, where one moment is all moments, was part of the reason I was, I, I was interested in the Hammonds cover. Um, also, I love David Hammonds' work in terms of its poetic um, use of the object to stand in for the thing, for the dynamic, for the, you know. And I think we could sneak in one more if that's all right with you. Um, and it's, um, the question is, you've done a good job um, painting scenarios that made black people feel seen. What do you hope to take away from these stories and encounters are? What was the original intent for how we, I guess as as readers are supposed to navigate these these stories. You mean the essays in Just Us? Are we in Just Us now? I think it's a broad question. <laughs> Just Us, Citizen. <laughs> I don't know. All encompassing. <laughs> All encompassing. <laughs> um, what did I want you? I you know I don't I don't actually want you to take away anything. I want you to enter and experience the process of thinking and of wondering. And what does it mean to be curious inside these stories, to, to take the questions as an opportunity to have your own questions, to see the fact checks as a moment to associate to another event that you remember, or to have the image bring up another image. So I'm really interested in the book as an experience, as a, a, a very open text that works in the way um, the best lyrical moments work. So there's no, there's no, um, you know, there's no, there's nothing that you get from it that you don't, you have to give it to get it <laughs> in a way. Um, that's, that's, I spend a lot of time thinking about how to keep this text as open as possible. That's wonderful, thank you. So yes, I wanna thank you both again um, and with support from um, this evening's ASL interpreters um, for a wonderful conversation. Um, on behalf of our partners, I'd also like to thank everyone for joining this evening. Pen Out Loud is America, Pen America's signature event series and we're honored to be partnering with the Strand Bookstore and Scripps Presents this fall. Um, next week on Tuesday, October 6th, come back and join us um, for our final event of the season. Um, it'll be an evening with award-winning author Marilyn Robinson for a discussion about her new novel, Jack, her fourth book in her now classic Gilead series, which have won one Pulitzer Prize and two National Books Critics Circle Awards. Um, Robinson will be in conversation with bestselling author Alexander Chi to interrogate the complexities of American history through a novel that resonates with the paradoxes of American life then and now. Um, tickets are still available. Um, we thank you again, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you.